As our passage today is 1 Peter 5 and verses 6 through 11 as we're getting close to concluding our series through 1 Peter. But let's uh, hear God's word now from 1 Peter 5 verses 6 to 11. Let us give our attention to God's holy and errant and inspired word. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, earlier this uh, year, a distressed uh, church member reached out to me for some pastoral advice, and uh, the reason for the distress was uh, that she had just started a job, and it, uh, it happened to be Pride Month, and her supervisor asked her what her shirt size was because she was going to order her an LGBTQ Pride t-shirt. Uh, that uh, she and all her co-workers would be wearing for work that month. Well, I and a few other Christians uh, counseled her to respectfully abstain from wearing the t-shirt since it endorses a, a sinful lifestyle which is nothing to be proud about. And that was what she thought already, but she just wanted to make sure and, and seek some advice from mature uh, Christian counselors. And, uh, and so she said no thank you to her supervisor. Um, but that's not always easy, is it, to do that, right? Thanks be to God that uh, she had the strength to do that in that moment. But it's not always easy to do that, to say no to your supervisor, especially when you just started a, a job, and, and uh, especially when it's uh, having to say no about such a hot-button cultural issue, right, that we... See today, would she lose her job? Would she be ridiculed and attacked by her coworkers for being the one odd person out, not wearing the shirt? Uh, What would you do in that situation? Well, by God's grace, she respectfully abstained, and thankfully she didn't lose her job. And as far as I know, her supervisor and coworkers at I haven't heard anything, but they, but they appeared to have not made a big issue about it. But it definitely caused some anxiety for her and uh, the others who were counseling her and praying for her during that time. And it's a sign of what Peter has been saying throughout this letter, isn't it? That as Christians, we are strangers and exiles in this world. And we shouldn't be surprised at the, the fiery trial when it comes upon us to test us, as though something strange were happening to us. Rather, we are too as we saw earlier, rejoice insofar as we share in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings so that we might also rejoice and be glad in His glory when He returns. Peter's been equipping the church for suffering for the sake of Christ. And uh, it can come in all kinds of forms. The anxieties we face for doing what is right and, and swimming against the cultural view of sexuality and uh, in some cases actually losing our job because of our convictions or being called a bigot. It might mean being ridiculed for our views of creation or our, our faith in a crucified and resurrected Messiah or our belief in the Bible as the authoritative Word of God or our belief that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And the list could go on. And sometimes persecution will be more severe uh, where it uh, could mean imprisonment or, or torture or losing our lives. How then shall we live as we suffer for the sake of Christ in this world? Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. 
Well, Peter has taught us much and encouraged us much in this letter of how we should respond to suffering and persecution in this life. He's given us great wisdom and counsel. Ultimately, he's called us to follow in the footsteps of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our suffering Savior. Uh, looking to his character as he endured through suffering and trusted in the one who will ultimately judge in the end and looked forward to the glory that was held out before him and did not lash out in revenge but uh, continued to love and show kindness and to even bless others who persecuted him. And that's what we're called to and, and to look forward to the hope that we have in Christ's return and, and God will strengthen us for that task by his spirit and, and and he gives us his word to equip us. And here Peter gives three final encouraging exhortations for us once again to how we should respond to suffering, and especially suffering for the sake of Christ. He calls us here to be humble under God, to be watchful of the devil, and to be confident in the future. So first we see here that he calls us to be humble under God. Notice verse 6, he says, therefore... Well, let me just stop there. He says, therefore... And as I always say, and many people say in the pulpit, right, what's the therefore, therefore, we got to think about that. And uh, it points back to verse 5, which we saw last week, where Peter just said, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, Augustine once uh, said that the three chief virtues of the Christian life are humility, humility, and humility. And indeed, humility is vitally important for the Christian life at all times, and the Bible constantly calls us to clothe ourselves in humility towards one another. And uh, we're to do so. It is vitally important for the Christian life at all times, but especially for the sake of maintaining the unity of the body of Christ in times of suffering. Uh, when tensions are high and people are irritable and people are anxious because of the sufferings they're going through, we especially need to clothe ourselves in humility toward one another. And that will, by God's Spirit, enable us to be patient and kind and compassionate towards one another as we go through suffering together. As one commentator put it, humility is the oil that allows relationships in the church to run smoothly and lovingly. But clothing ourselves with humility is not just a horizontal thing. It's also a vertical thing. And that's what Peter has in mind in verses 6 to 7. Uh, not only do we need to clothe ourselves in humility towards man, but we are to clothe ourselves in humility toward God. And so Peter exhorts us, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Uh, there's a connection that uh, Peter wants us to see here between anxiety and pride. Now, there is, of course, a, a good anxiety that the Bible talks about, and that's just simply a genuine concern for other people. Uh, but uh, Peter's not talking about that. He's talking about uh, more of a selfish concern, or even a concern for others, but, but one that, uh, that has gotten out of control, where it just is eating us up on the in inside, and we refuse to go to God in prayer and bring it before Him. As one person put it, anxiety screams that, that we've taken over the reins of our lives and stopped trusting God. It shouts that our circumstances have bolted out of control, and God hasn't curbed them to our satisfaction. And it orders him to shove over and give us a shot at it. Anxiety puts us in the spotlight and blinds us to the face of God's sovereign care. And Peter's just said that God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He's opposed to the one who refuses to humble themselves in prayer and clings to their anxiety and pride. And so if you want grace for the things you are worried about, you need to pray and, and ask God for sustaining grace and uh, gracious deliverance if it should be His will to deliver you. If you don't pray and ask for 
grace from God if you remain proud and cling to your anxiety rather than casting your anxiety upon Him in prayer. Don't expect to receive grace. He gives grace to those who humbly acknowledge their need and ask. Right? Did not our Lord say, what did He say in the Sermon on the Mount about asking? He said, ask and you will receive. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? You see, He wants us to ask Him. Don't be too proud to humbly ask God for help and strength for whatever is weighing you down like a burden on your back and eating you up on the inside. One uh, pastor in the past wrote this, God's sweet dews and showers of grace slide off the mountains of pride, fall on the low valleys of humble hearts and make them pleasant and fertile. What an image, and that's the image that we should hold fast to. And so Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And how do you do that then? How do you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God? Well, he goes on, and this is how you do it. By casting all your anxieties on Him. And why should we do that? Because He cares for you. Isn't that an amazing promise? His words echo Psalm 55. Cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. The psalmist there was lamenting because of the dangerous enemies that were attacking him. And and the, the hardest thing for him in that psalm is that even a close friend had betrayed him. And he casts his cares on the Lord. And he exhorts us, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. And so, beloved, cast all your anxieties upon God in prayer. Because not only he cares for you, But as Peter says here, his hand is mighty. You see, these two things, they work together to encourage us to pray and to cast our anxieties upon God in prayer. These two things encourage us to humbly pray. God's hand is mighty and he cares for you and me. Think about those two things. Are you anxious about something right now? A a job situation, perhaps? A relationship? How to pay your bills, the health of a loved one, uh, the physical health of your children, the spiritual health of your children, your lost loved one, the ridicule of unbelievers. Are you anxious about government power and politics? Are you anxious about possible persecution one day? Are you anxious about whether you'll ever marry or or be single for the rest of your life are you anxious about your struggling marriage what are you anxious about what is it that keeps you up at night what is it that consumes your thoughts beloved god is all powerful and he cares for you yes each of you i think our temptation is to say well he he probably cares for everybody else in this room but it, it doesn't seem like he cares For me, no, He cares for you. You may think He's too busy running the universe to care about little old me. He cares. You may think you've somehow been forgotten amongst His children who are much better than you. He cares. You may think, but I've done some terrible sinful things, so how could He care for me? Surely I've sinned too many times and He's had it. He's fed up. He cares. But how do I know for sure that he cares? Because he did not spare his only son, but gave him up on the cross for you. If you ever doubt his love and care for you, that is where you must look ultimately. Not to your circumstances, but to Christ's circumstance as he suffered and bled and was tortured and bore the wrath of God. In your place, because of your sins, he took your place. He took God's wrath. He took the curse of the law upon himself 
for you because He cares for you as your Savior. The Son of God cares for you. God the Father cares for you. God the Spirit cares for you. And God has clearly demonstrated that in the cross. And so humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. God grants grace to those who recognize their need and misery before Him and cast it all on Him, trusting His power and care. He grants grace to either be rescued from the problem in His perfect timing or for sustaining grace to persevere through it to glory on the last day. The proud, on the other hand, ultimately think they know better than God and that things are too out of control of, for God. And so, I need to take control of this. I need to fix it. And so the proud don't pray. They don't cast all their anxiety upon God because they don't trust His mighty hand and they don't trust that He cares for them. And so the anxiety just, uh, they cling to it. It eats them up on the inside and it zaps them of the strength that they need for today to do what's right in, in difficult circumstances. And it, and it causes them to be irritable around others and to take out their frustrations on others and on God. Is that you today? Are you too proud to pray? Are you clinging to anxious thoughts? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Cast all your anxieties upon Him because He cares for you. And He is almighty. Uh, this phrase, the mighty hand of God, reminds us of the Exodus account. As it's often uh, used, this phrase, in the Bible to describe the redemption of Israel from slavery in Egypt and, and also other times where God had rescued His people. For example, we sang earlier in Psalm 136 that God brought Israel out from among Egypt for His steadfast love endures forever with a strong hand and an outstretched arm for His steadfast love endures forever. And so by using this phrase here, Peter wants us to trust that God's hand is mighty to save, just as he was, His hand was mighty to save Israel from Egypt. And, and think of His power and might displayed in the, the plagues of Egypt. And how He parted the Red Sea. And how He brought His people through on dry ground, safely to the other side, and then judged their enemies in the Red Sea. Peter wants us to reflect on that and to think of that as we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. Let us remember His mighty deeds of old, how He created the world out of nothing by just speaking it into existence, how He continues to sustain it at all times, our every breath, and how He redeems His people from all their afflictions in His perfect timing, in His perfect way, in His almighty way, because He cares for us. He is the God of creation. He is the God of providence. And He is the God of redemption and consummation. And so let us humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting all our anxieties upon Him, because He cares for us. Now that doesn't mean that, that if you just pray once and uh, cast your anxieties on God, that all your anxiety will just kind of magically disappear, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I sometimes am really anxious about something, and I, I pray about it, and, and I walk away from that prayer, you know, feeling more at rest because I've prayed, trusting God. But isn't it true that often those anxious thoughts creep back in? They come back, right? They're like, they just keep coming back like a, like a wound that is flared up again, right? And we need to treat it again. We need to go back to God in prayer. We've got to go back to Him and cast our anxieties upon Him again in prayer. That's the struggle of the Christian life. It's continually trusting your cares to Him. And so go back to Him. If, it, if the anxieties come back, don't think, well, prayer doesn't work. No, it works. He promises that He cares for you and He will sustain you through the trials. And Peter adds, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Right? We have to remember that He has infinite wisdom and knowledge. He knows what's best for His children and His timing is therefore perfect. And so He will hear and answer your prayer at the proper time, but He will answer it. It, it may be in this life at times He does deliver us from our circumstances, but He will sustain us through the troubles. 
But what Peter especially refers to here when he talks about the proper time is the return of Christ. Because throughout this letter we've seen how over and over again he's, he's pointing us forward to the return of Christ as we go through sufferings in this life and to the hope of glory that is to be revealed on that day when we see our Savior face to face and are like Him and there's no more so- sorrow, no more death, no more sins, no more suffering. That is ultimately the proper time and He will come again at the perfect time, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so as you suffer, be humble under God. And secondly, he says, be watchful of the devil. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. And why is that? Why do we need to be alert? Why do we need to be watchful? Well, Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Right? Right? Uh, Sometimes it can be a challenge to, you know, pay attention during a sermon and, and stay awake, and especially when it's hot and uh, maybe you didn't get much sleep last night, and so maybe you get a little bit sleepy. But boy, if there was a roaring lion who wa- that walked into this room, that would wake you up, right? It can be loud, too, to wake you up. But that would wake you up. You'd be alert. You'd be watchful. Or if you knew one was outside and the doors were shut, you'd, you'd be alert. You'd be careful, right? Go into your car. And Peter wants to give us this, this terrifying image of a roaring lion, children, that uh, is hungry. He's seeking someone to devour, to gulp down, like the giant fish gulped down Jonah. This is our adversary, the devil, as Peter describes him here. Uh, you know, it doesn't always communicate very clearly to us. We often view lions at a distance, uh, you know, at a zoo, behind a cage, or on TV, but it probably communicated quite clearly to them and their experience because some of the early Christians were thrown to the lions because of their faith. But we do know that uh, lions are ferocious predators and I'm pretty sure no one here wants to be in a room with a wild, hungry lion. And uh, that's why Peter wants us to see this image here so that we know that we truly have an enemy, an adversary who is dangerous we ought not to deny his existence. We ought not to think that he's, you know, like, d- doesn't hate us and, and isn't dangerous. He's dangerous. We need to be alert. We need to be watchful. But that's not meant to ultimately cripple us in fear. Rather, it's just meant to wake us up spiritually. Don't be ignorant of his schemes. Don't think he doesn't exist. Don't think he's not really a threat. Don't think that you can fight him in your own strength. Don't be caught off guard. Don't fall asleep spiritually. And Peter knew from experience what could happen when one is presumptuous and uh, thinks that he can stand in his own strength, right? You remember the story of Peter in the gospel narratives, right? And, and remember when Jesus said that somebody amongst his disciples is going to deny him. And what did Peter say? Not me. <laughs> I'd never do that. Uh, you know, Lord, all of them might do that. Okay, but I'll never do that. I'll go to death for you. And what does the Lord say? No, Peter, you, man, I'm talking about you, Peter. You're going to be the one who's going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And uh, Peter still can't believe it. And he says, I tell you the truth, uh, Satan asked to sift you like wheat, Peter, but I've prayed for you. And that's why Peter endures, not because of his own strength, because of the Lord's prayer for him. And what does he do when Jesus is on trial? Sure enough, he, he denies our Lord three times, a grievous sin. And when God, Jesus looked at him, he wept bitterly and ran away. But thanks be to God that Jesus prayed for Peter, and thanks be to God that Jesus died for Peter's sins and, and then granted him peace and forgiveness when he was raised from the dead and restored him. But you see, Peter wants us to learn from him. He wants us to learn to to not fall asleep spiritually, not to be like him in the Garden of Gethsemane, falling asleep. And the Lord says, wake up, be watchful and in prayer. Don't be asleep spiritually. And Peter says, don't learn from me. Don't make the same mistake that I did. Don't be presumptuous. Don't be proud. Don't think you can do this Christian life in your own strength. Take heed lest you fall. 
Pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. We need to pray. We need to be watchful. And we need to be aware of the devil's schemes, right? He's the father of lies. He's like a a good fisherman who reveals the bait, but, but hides the hook, right? And we need to expose the hook with the truth of God's word. We need to shine the light on the dark reality of sin and how it is destructive of of us and others and ultimately is a banquet in the grave if it goes unchecked and isn't repented of. And We need to expose the devil's lies with the truth of God's Word. And and then when Satan tempts us and says, well, it's really not that big of a deal. God's going to forgive you. Sin is not that serious. No, it is. Look at what Jesus had to do to save us from our sins. He had to be crucified and suffer God's wrath. That's how serious it is. And that's one of our strategies of fighting against that temptation. Oh, it's no big deal. Yes, it is. You look to the cross. And then when the times you do fail and sin, and he attacks you and accuses you because he's our accuser of the brethren. And he says he doesn't love you. Look at what you've done. He'll never forgive you of that. You say, yes, He will, because look at how He loves me on the cross. You go over and over again to the cross and God's Word. You pray. You're watchful. Be sober-minded and watchful in prayer. And, and Peter says, don't just be on the defensive here. Go on the offensive as well. Notice verse 9. He calls us to actively resist Him. And How do you resist Him? Well, as I've already said, you don't resist Him in your own strength. You resist Him in prayer and in the spirit strength and and notice that peter adds here firm in your faith we might ask faith in what faith in ourselves Uh, faith in the wisdom of the world ultimately no faith in god's word and faith in christ remember how jesus resisted the devil when the devil tempted him what did he do what was his weapon It was the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. He quoted Scripture back to the devil over and over again. And that's what we need to do. As Paul says says in Ephesians 6, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Beloved, you must put on the full armor of God daily in the spiritual war that we are in. You can't coast in the Christian life and expect to be spiritually safe. If you do, you're like low-hanging fruit that the devil easily picks off and devours, gulps down. You need to be in prayer and you need to be in God's Word daily and fighting against the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil standing firm in your faith in Christ. So let me ask you then, how is your daily prayer life? How is your daily meditation on God's Word going? If it's not there at all, you are in grave spiritual danger. Take up the armor of God today. Renew your commitment to be in prayer and in God's Word. And if it is there, but you struggle, keep fighting for this. We all struggle to some extent with prayer and being in God's Word, but let's keep fighting for this by God's grace. Keep carving out time for prayer and meditation on God's Word and and use it to do battle against the devil and to find strength to persevere in the Christian life because God's hand is mightier than the devil and He cares for you and Jesus wins in the end. Right? The line of the tribe of Judah is greater than then the lion of the bottomless pit. Jesus says, in this world you have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world, and greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And Christ will come again and cast the devil into the eternal lake of fire, and all who followed in the devil's ways. As one person put it, the delivering lion opposes and defeats the devouring lion. As we'll sing shortly, Martin Luther's hymn, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Keep pressing on in faith in Christ. Stand firm in your faith in Christ. 
and know that Christ will come again and deliver His people and bring them into the eternal kingdom of heaven. Not because of our own merits. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but thanks be to God that the Lion of the tribe of Judah is also the Lamb who was slain for our sins. Thanks be to God that He suffered once for all our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. And we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if God is for us, who can be against us ultimately? And we can also be sure that we are not alone in this spiritual war that we are in. Right? This is another one of Satan's tactics. To make us think that we're all alone. That whatever sufferings we are going through are unique to us. As if no other child of God has ever been through what we're going through and nobody knows what we're going through. And, and we're all alone and, and, and somehow God has forgotten us and something's wrong with us and we're, we're, we're all alone in suffering. But God's Word says, no, you're not alone. You're suffering nothing that is new under the sun, nothing that is unique to you as a Christian. From the beginning of time, right after the fall, you have that first gospel promise. And, and God said, I will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so it's been ever since that there is enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There has always been sufferings in the Christian life. There's always been persecution from the seed of the serpent throughout redemptive history, and it is so to this day. So whatever sufferings you're going through in the Christian life, know that you're not alone. And if you're persecuted for the faith, know that you're not the first. So many of our brothers and sisters in Christ right now are being persecuted and ridiculed for their faith. Some are being tortured. Some are being imprisoned. Some are being put to death. And look at church history. This is one of the values of church history, to know that you're not alone and to be encouraged and, 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 and to see the wonder of their faith by God's grace and how they stood firm in the faith. It motivates us to know that we're not alone and that by God's Spirit, we too can persevere because He preserves us in the faith and Jesus wins in the end. And so, so know that you have brothers and sisters. God has blessed you with brothers and sisters in Christ in this church first and foremost, but even around the city and around the world. And so pray for them and take heart that they are with you in this battle and they're praying for you. Ask each other, how can I pray for you? What are you going through that I can pray? How can I help carry the burden with, for you as well? Because not only does God care for you, but I care for you as a brother or sister in Christ. And so we're in this battle together and we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And that brings us to our third point. Be confident in your future, Peter says. Be humble under God, be watchful of the devil, and be confident in your future. He says, and after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Well, comforting words for us as we suffer in many ways in this present evil age in these verses here. Notice that Peter says that our suffering is, is only for a little while. Now, that, that isn't always our experience, is it, right? Actually, when we suffer, uh, isn't it true that time, it seems to just slow down to a crawl? It doesn't seem like time is going quickly. It seems like it's just going way too slow. It doesn't seem like a little while. And so is Peter just kind of being insensitive here? Is he, is he out to lunch? Does he not know? Well, no, Peter went through all kinds of sufferings. Way more than we've ever been through. Look at the book of Acts. He's not being insensitive here to the real pain we go through in times of suffering and how it seems like it's never going to end. I mean, remember that earlier he said that we've been grieved by various trials, affirming that they're grievous. It's okay to call them grievous trials. It's okay to to lament them in prayer. Uh, but Peter here is not speaking subjectively about how we feel in the midst of suffering. He's speaking objectively in the light of all of eternity. Right? Because isn't it true that when, compare, when we compare time on this earth to all of eternity, isn't it a short time? Even if we happen to live 100 years, wouldn't that be crazy to live 100 years? 
But even if we lived 100 years, isn't 100 years just minuscule in length of time compared to billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of years? In other words, all of eternity? What is 100 years compared to all of eternity? And that's just comparing the length of our glory to the length of our suffering. We could also talk about the weight of glory compared to the weight of our suffering here as Paul does elsewhere. Or as Peter puts it here, the God of all grace will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Isn't that a comforting promise? I love how it says that God Himself, God Himself will do this. In other words, He isn't going to outsource it. He isn't going to delegate it. He's not going to send an angel to do this. You know, sometimes my wife and I ask our older children to take care of our, our, our three-year-old. It's nice to delegate sometimes, right? But if your three-year-old has really hurt herself, does she really want her 12-year-old brother to comfort her and clean her wounds? No, she wants who? She wants her mommy and maybe daddy. But she doesn't want that delegated to a sibling in that moment. And when we arrive, beloved, at the New Jerusalem, we don't want to see an angel after all that we've been through. We want to see our God. We want to see our Savior who cares for us. And beloved, we will see Him face to face in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord, for He who has seen the Son, has seen the Father. He's seen God in the flesh. And and beloved, that's our blessed hope, that after you have suffered a little while, God Himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Or as Revelation 21 puts it, He will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And not only that, but we'll receive the unfading crown of eternal glory. He'll restore what's been lost. He'll confirm us forever in glory with no second chance of a fall. He'll strengthen us by His power so that we no longer suffer in these weak bodies and souls tainted by sin. We'll have new resurrected bodies and perfected souls free from all sin and we'll be established once and for all in His blessed presence in the consummated kingdom of God. What a glorious promise we have here in God's Word. Amen? And notice that it's all of grace from beginning to end. It comes from the God of all grace. And He has effectually called us to this eternal glory. And nothing can revoke that call. As Paul says in Romans 8, and those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. And so as you suffer in this life, be confident in the, in the future knowing that eternal glory awaits you. It's certain, and it will all be worth it in the end. In the great divorce, C.S. Lewis reflected on how the future promised to us in Christ functions to fortify us to share in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings today. Uh, he said, heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into a glory. Uh, He compared our future and glory to being like waking up from a nightmare. When you have a nightmare and perhaps in that nightmare you lose a loved one in a dream, then when you wake up you are greatly relieved that it was just a dream and now you are awake. And then when you see that loved one again, you embrace them and are so much more thankful for them because you had that nightmare. It's a little bit different morning than other mornings, right? I'm not saying that nightmares are fun in and of themselves, but they can make the reality of waking up so much sweeter. In a similar way, Lewis was saying, whatever sufferings we go through in this life makes the glories of the age to come that much sweeter. It will be like waking up from a really bad dream on a new day. A new day where there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. For the old order of things will have passed away along with persecution. Now I realize that every analogy breaks down at some point. Because in that analogy, one of the things we realize when waking up from a dream is that it didn't really happen, right? And uh, when we enter the new heavens, new earth, we won't be thinking that it really didn't happen. 
Our sufferings on earth really did happen, and so it wasn't just a dream in that sense. But the point of the analogy is simply that heaven will be all the more sweet because of the sufferings we've been through. And also, as we've seen in 1 Peter, God has a good purpose behind all of our sufferings. He is using them all to purify us like gold being refined in a fire, to purify us from our sins so that we become more beautiful like Jesus Christ. He's using them to keep us on the right path so that we don't fall off the cliff. He's our good shepherd. We've returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls in Christ. And none of your sufferings will ever be wasted in God's providence. He will use them all for your ultimate good. And so, beloved, as you go through sufferings in this life, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, for he cares for you. And be watchful of the devil. Resist him firm in your faith. And be confident in your future because he himself will wipe away all your tears and, and restore you and confirm you and establish you forever in his eternal kingdom where you will forever praise him and say with Peter here, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us and we pray that you would write it on our hearts by your Holy Spirit that we might bear up under sufferings as our Lord and Savior did, following in his footsteps, not reviling those who revile us, uh, not attacking them, but even praying for our persecutors, uh, praying for our enemies, blessing those who persecute us, even as, as Christ did and, and said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do and help us to follow in his footsteps and the pathway of suffering, knowing that it ultimately leads for those who trust in Christ to glory uh, that uh, will all be worth it in the end. And we long to see our Savior face to face. And so come, Lord Jesus, quickly come. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.